Hey guys, today I'm going to be talking about polarity and dipole moments. So at first this concept can be kind of tricky, but once you get into why some molecules are polar and why some are nonpolar, it becomes really easy to apply these properties to different molecules. So let's get started with talking about what exactly a dipole moment is. So on page 77 of our course reader, Dr. Lavelle outlines a dipole moment as the Greek letter mu equaling the charge times the distance between the two atoms. But what does that actually mean? So we can look at the molecule HCl as an example. An important concept to figure this out will be that protons and electrons have the same magnitude of charge. Another important concept will be electronegativity. So here, which is the more electronegative atom? Well, we know by our periodic properties that chlorine is the more electronegative of the two. This is important in determining where our dipole moment will be and which direction it will face. So we can draw our dipole moment using a vector towards the more electronegative atom. So I'm just representing our dipole moment with this vector in the red. The dipole moment will always face towards the more electronegative atom. And you can also think of it in terms of charges. So we know that hydrogen has a positive charge and chlorine has a negative charge, right? So because chlorine is more electronegative and our dipole moment will face chlorine, this means that chlorine will also have a partial negative charge as it becomes more electron dense. This also means that hydrogen will lose electron density and gain a partial positive charge. So how do you determine whether this molecule is polar or nonpolar? Well, we can take a look at the direction of our vector, right? So if we look at this equation, we see that mu equals the charge of the atom times this distance between hydrogen and chlorine. Now we're not responsible for knowing the exact numerical values, but if you went and looked this up like I did, you would know that our dipole moment equals 1.1 divides, which is our unit for a dipole. Now the key concept here is that our dipole is non-zero. It's a non-zero value, which means that if it's non-zero, this will be a polar molecule. So we can determine and conclude that HCl is a polar molecule just by looking at the direction of our dipoles and electron negativity. So next I'm gonna go on to some examples, starting with carbon dioxide. Now again, let's start with determining which is the more electronegative atom. Well, here we only have two atoms, right? We have carbon and oxygen. We know that carbon is less electronegative than oxygen. So we are going to draw our dipole vectors towards the more electronegative atom, which in this case is oxygen. This is where it's very important that you draw your Lewis structure correctly because as we do more examples, like H2O, you'll see that if you draw in the lone pairs or the bonds incorrectly, it can really affect your polarity of the molecule. So once we've drawn in our dipole moments, let's determine whether or not this is polar or nonpolar. Well, in this case, since we have two vectors of equal magnitude, remember, because protons and electrons have equal magnitude of charge, but they're in opposite directions, we will have a dipole moment of zero, which is different than the zero dipole moment that, or the non-zero dipole moment that we got in hydrogen chloride, right? So if your dipole moment is zero, this means that it will be a non-polar value. Non-polar molecule, okay? Whereas if you have a non-zero value, it will be a polar molecule. So let's also analyze water. A lot of people know that H2O is a polar molecule, but why exactly is it a polar molecule? Well, if we look at the Lewis structure, you might think that since we have two atoms attached to the central atom, like we did in CO2, you will also get the same result of nonpolar. But in fact, we have two lone pairs on the oxygen, which is really key in this analysis. So when we take the lone pairs into account, we find that H2O has a bent structure. 
So when we draw in the dipole moments toward the more electronegative atom, which in this case is oxygen, we also have to remember that we have two regions of electron density that will result in a net dipole moment pointing upward. So because there's no downward pole to counteract this upward dipole force, we will have a non-zero value for our dipole, which means, remember, that this will be polar. So again, drawing your Lewis structures and including lone pairs is really key in determining whether or not a molecule is polar or nonpolar. So let's move on to carbon tetrachloride. So here, we know that this structure is tetrahedral, right? So here's where it gets uh, maybe a little confusing because it's hard to visualize this on a 2D platform because it's easier when you have a 3D model to, to figure this out. But here we've drawn our Lewis structure with all of our lone pairs. So we can go ahead and draw in our dipole moments, right? We know that chlorine is much more electronegative than carbon. So let's go ahead, draw our dipole moments towards the chlorine. So here you can see that because we have two vectors on opposite sides of each other that are equal in magnitude, opposite in direction, all of these vectors will cancel out. So we will have a dipole moment of zero, which means that this molecule is nonpolar. However, it's really important to not associate tetrahedral shape with, non, with a nonpolar molecule. Because if you just replace one atom with another in a structure, it can completely change the polarity. So for example, in chloroform, we replaced a chlorine with a hydrogen. So once again, let's go ahead and draw our dipole moments. Now here we see that carbon is more electronegative than hydrogen, right? So unlike our top structure, our dipole moment will actually be facing down. So here, even though these may cancel, we will actually get a net dipole moment that's facing downward. And since there isn't an upward pole to balance that out, we will end up getting a dipole moment that is non-zero. Which means that this is a polar molecule. Now for my last example, I'm gonna go over a more challenging structure that was also on our midterm and also in the homework problems. So this is really important a molecule to go over. So here we have xenon difluoride. Here is, it's really important to count the electrons when you're drawing your Lewis structure. So here, to start out, we know that xenon has eight electrons. Fluorine has seven each, since we have two. We have 14 electrons total for the fluorines, meaning that we have 22 electrons total for the molecule. So when we're drawing our structure, let's start out by putting the fluorines opposite of each other. That's our default when we only have two molecules. We're gonna put them as far apart as possible, right? And let's add in our lone pairs on the fluorine. Now let's stop and count at how many electrons we actually have. 2, 4, 6, 7, 8, 2, 4, 6, 7, 8. So we have 16 electrons, which still means that we have six electrons to add in. This means that xenon will have three lone pairs, okay? Now this will change and affect our polarity significantly. You may think that this would be similar to water, right? Since you have two lone pairs, the molecule might be bent. But really, this is where visualizing this on a 3D platform can be helpful. We have five regions of electron density, which means that you would think it would be trigonal bipyramidal, since our Vesper formula is AX2E3. So if we were to draw this, in kind of a 3D shape, I'm going to do my best here, we would see the central atom having one, two, three, four, five regions of electron density, but the fluorines 
are directly opposite of each other. So when we draw in our dipole moments, we know that fluorine is very electronegative. We have to remember that this will not be a bent molecule. This will actually, they will cancel out because they're completely opposite of each other. So you really have to keep in mind the uh, molecular structures when you're doing these problems. So this molecule will actually end up being nonpolar. So I hope these examples helped you understand polarity and good luck.